going to tell you a little bit about modularity. So, <clears throat> and probably also return to some of these computations in a slightly slower way. Perhaps I should have delayed them to the start of this lecture anyway. But I think what I'm going to do is talk about modularity for a bit, and then maybe we'll come back to some of these explicit computations in a slightly more leisurely way if we have time. But I'm going to erase them, so hopefully they won't be too distant in your mind. Um, <clears throat> OK, chalk, chalk, chalk. Right, so I want to talk this hour about modularity of the fusion category. Well, and so really I'm going to, <clears throat> you know, every lecture I seem to switch back and forth. So the last lecture we were talking about, well, given a ribbon category, how do we build the TFT? And now I'm going to be focusing more back on the other direction. Uh, but let me kind of explain that. Why? So what's the situation we're in? So I told you what all these generators are, but as came up in some of the questions, we kind of need to know whether or not it worked. Did it really, if I presented um, a three manifold in two different ways, did they act, did it actually lead to the same number at the end of the day? And so we could phrase that as, does the list of generators um, or say the list of values on those generators actually give a topological field theory. And so as was mentioned, what do you need to do? You need to essentially check all the relations um, between the generators. And I didn't tell you even a single one of those relations. Kind of implicitly, I did by mentioning that some things needed to live in adjoint pairs, and things like that. But, um, but really, I didn't tell you those. And, and I'm um, not going to tell you almost any of them. But let me just say the following miracle of what actually happens is that only one more condition arises in checking all the relations. Which is kind of a big surprise. I mean, you, you have all these different generators, and you write down some big relation involving like 10 different of these generators all having to compose and equal something. You might well think that would impose some conditions on these different maps that I wrote down that would tell you something about your category. And the fact is that only one of them doesn't follow from all the structure we've already baked in to the ribbon category. And that condition is called modularity. So let me explain what sort of what modularity um, what the mod modularity relation is in the Bordism category. That is what it is geometrically. And then we'll see, well, we'll see immediately how that translates into algebra. So here are two three manifolds. Um, well, I'm going to. OK, these are not two three manifolds. These are two two manifolds. But um, so here are two diffeomorphisms. So again, I don't know which colors are visible. But so that's, say, one circle just around one of the legs. And then the other circle goes around this way. And so this diffeomorphism going to the right, which I'll call S takes the green circle to that green circle, 
and the red circle to the one that goes around the leg. So this diffeomorphism just interchanges those two generating circles. And I'll just call the inverse diffeomorphism S inverse. So I called them three manifolds because, again, I'm always thinking about the mapping cylinder of the diffeomorphism. So these three manifolds are not among the generators that I told you. So these are not among the generators that I listed over there. Um, and so that means that they should be decomposable in terms of the generators. We'll get to that in a second, but here is a relation. Well, it's a pretty silly relation to say, but S times S inverse is the identity on the three torus. By construction, they were inverse diffeomorphisms. But now, suppose I take S and decompose it in terms of my generators, and then I take S inverse and decompose it in terms of my generators, and then I send um, the result using the actual values into my target linear categories, I can then ask whether or not the resulting relation is satisfied in linear categories. And it's not, there's no a priori reason that it needs to be satisfied. And that's going to be the new algebraic condition. Um, so let me just write that down. So essentially we need to express S in terms of generators and the same for S inverse. And then we need to check whether Z of S times Z of S inverse. OK, now I'm, you know, I really should have introduced some different notation. Let me call, let me call the composite. Um, so let me call the expression S tilde in terms of generators, and I do the same for S inverse, and that results in something which I'll call S inverse tilde. So this is now some composite of elementary generators, and so then I can apply my candidate functor to those two composites, and then I ask, is that the identity Um, and so in particular, I need to, if this is going to be true, then Z of S um, tilde needs to be invertible. So in particular, I certainly need Z of S tilde to be invertible. And that is actually some condition on all the um, equations that I've written down over there. And let's now try to figure out what condition it is. So so the first thing we need to do is, is this expression. So let me you that so this is um, so this proposition is going to express s in terms of generators except just to make my life and yours easier I'm going to ignore some of the generators so I'm going to ignore um, the associators and the left and right units and the Frobeniusators so I'm going to ignore all the things that kind of look trivial in the plane, um, just so the expression isn't quite as long and cumbersome. But you can always go back and fill in those things if you want to. So with that um, caveat, I can write S as the following composite. So I start with a torus like this. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to 
say at this point here over on the right, I'm going to punch a hole using um, epsilon. So let me actually name. So these things going in the opposite direction, I'm going to call with the same letter op. So this is epsilon op is the hole punching and eta op, and if I needed the mu op and nu op. So I first do epsilon op to punch a hole right at the um, at that spot. So this point turned into that hole. And then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a double braiding. So let me show you where the pair of pants is I want to consider. So I'm going to take the bottom half of this figure and think about it as a pair of pants where the two outside things are the legs coming into the center, which I think of as the waist. And so this is, I'm going to do a double braiding along that pair of pants. And so it's a double braiding, so it returns to the same figure here. And <clears throat> a little more space. And then what I want to do is I want to kill the other hole, filling it in using epsilon. So, so this hole now I'm going to kill. OK. Um, so was there a question back there? No. Yep. All the way through. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> well, um, it's definitely not obvious that, well, anyway, to me at first it was not obvious that this was S, um, but it turns out it is. Um, the reason it's not um, just obvious is that it's not even obvious that this is an invertible. Uh, I mean, this three manifold I produced by doing some non-trivial surgery operations. So, at first blush, it doesn't even it doesn't look like it ought to be the mapping cylinder of any diffeomorphism, let alone this one. But it turns out it is actually as a three manifold Braille boundary diffeomorphic to the mapping cylinder of this diffeomorphism. And I won't say any more about that. Um, but, but what I do want to do is actually compute this map S for you. Um, but before doing that, I need to, we need to know what the source and target are. So let me uh, leave the following exercise. So, so again, suppose Z is. Um, TFT of the kind we've been describing, then you know, calculate that Z of the two torus is a vector space of rank R, where R is the rank of Z of S1, though whereby rank this means the number of simple objects. Um, and moreover, what's a, we're going to really need to know what a basis for this is. So a basis for that vector space is the collection of internal strings labeled by i as i runs over the simples like that. I guess blue is not distinguishable from white either. 
Okay. Um, any questions about that much before I compute? Okay, so let's actually compute. Um, Z of S using this expression for S. Uh, I guess it would have been better if I'd left room to do it right underneath that picture, but this has not happened. Oh, I, I'm going to want those. Well, I'll just try to fit it in here. Okay, so we start with our torus, and we're going to start with a particular basis element, which we've claimed is this internal string. So that's some element of the vector space we start with, and we're going to be sending it. You know, this whole thing is a map from CR to CR, so it's some explicit um, endomorphism of CR. And so we started with the basis element, and we just need to compute where it goes. So let's find out. So what's the first thing we do? Well, we did epsilon op. So let's go over to our formulas that we defined. So this one was epsilon op. So we already have something slightly complicated. So let's draw that. So here's the surface. So we still have I running around here, and then we produced another copy of a simple object J, and then we took a sum over DJ over P. Okay, and now what's the next step? Well, the next step is we did a double braiding Thank you. Sum over j. Now we did a double braiding, so I only drew what happened for a single braiding. But suppose you did a double. Uh, suppose you did another braiding on top here. Well, that would introduce another internal braiding of those two strings, and then the the legs would just pull themselves right apart from the symmetric structure. So this double braiding really does just implement a double braiding on the internal strings. So this just involves redrawing this picture with a slight modification. So again, sum over j, dj over p. And now these two strings that come down into the middle have a double braiding, i, j, like that. And now, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to do epsilon on this other hole. So epsilon was the easy one. I didn't have to do anything to the string. I guess I've erased it now. But for all the maps going this way, it was easy. I just didn't have to do anything. So then we're left with a single hold, torus, and sum over j, dj over p, and then we have this loop here labeled by i, double braiding into this loop around the hole labeled by j. OK, so that's good. This is supposed to be some element of the target vector space. The only problem is we don't quite recognize which element it is yet, so we need to we need to actually compute what element this is in the target vector space. And so for that, we need a small lemma, which is that if we have one string, say labeled i, braiding around another string labeled j, so now, <clears throat> This is just in any braided category. Um, well, in any braided category with duals, I can form this picture. It's some map from the simple object i to the simple object i, which means it's a scalar. So this is just some scalar. And the 
the claim then is that what this scalar is, oh, I guess I wanted to do it on the other side. Let me redraw it just so it'll be obvious how, how it applies. So I instead wanted to have the loop closing on the I side. So now I've mapped from the simple object J to itself, so that's some scalar, and the claim is that that scalar is the value of this braid labeled by I and J divided by DJ times the identity operator on J. So, so just to be clear, this whole thing is you know, okay, it might be a little confusing if you haven't seen these kinds of string diagrams before. You know, whenever you have a diagram that's just floating on its own, you can just evaluate it to a map from the unit object to the unit object, which gives you a complex number, and so it makes sense to, for instance, divide that by some other complex number. So that whole thing is just some complex coefficient, and this is some morphism in the category from J to J, and that's what the left-hand side is, so that's how you read these kinds of pictures. Okay, and so just to check this, um, both, of, both sides are scalars, and so it's sufficient to see that they have the same trace, and so if I take the trace of the left-hand side and take the trace of the right-hand side, then I have this trace of J, which gives the quantum dimension DJ, and it cancels, and I just have the same picture. So that proves that lemma. Um, Okay, but now we can use this right here to kind of rip off um, this copy of I. So using that, we can just redraw this as the following. So sum over dj, so sum again sum over j, dj over p, well, we're going to pick up a factor of dj on the bottom, so this is sum one over p, and then we have a copy of this little hop flink labeled by i and j, and then we have this copy of j sitting there around the torus hole. And this free-floating thing is inside the torus, but actually it's just a complex number, so we can pull it out and so this whole thing is just equal to sum over j uh, times the hop flink over p times now the basis vector j. So now we've really computed this whole map want to keep all these things, so I'm going to go back this direction. So what do we conclude? That's not white. Um, so we conclude that Z of S which was this map we we're trying to compute from CR to CR is exactly given by the matrix SIJ equals the value of the hop flink IJ over P. So the IJ entry of this transformation is exactly that complex number. Um, Okay, and so now putting the different pieces together, what we needed to know was that the, okay, I guess actually I'd called this, I decided to call this S tilde when I wrote it here, um, which means I suppose we've computed Z of S tilde. And so we needed to know that Z of S tilde was invertible in order to have a hope of it satisfying the relations that exist in the Bordism category. And so this tells us that we need um, this matrix Sij to be invertible. 
And of course, I mean, this is a matrix that's completely determined by the, um, by the ribbon category that we fed in. So now we can define. So provided we're in the context we've been talking about, which is to say we're talking about semi-simple categories with finitely many simple objects. So if we have um, a ribbon tensor category that's semi-simple with finitely many simple objects is called modular. If this um, S matrix is invertible, so if the matrix given by computing these hop links with i and j in the category is invertible. OK. Yeah. Oh. Um. <clears throat> Nothing fancy is going on. OK, um, and so just to, uh, I mean, just to state what is maybe already clear, um, the point is that S was invertible in the Bordism category, and therefore its image in LinCAD is invertible. And so the conclusion of that is that for Z a TFT, Z of S1 is modular. So that follows from what we've said. Uh, why? Um, well, I mean, it follows from your condition also composing S with S inverse, which is S. Yeah. Um, well, and also because I wanted to be one of the generators that has SBZ. Right. So, certainly nothing I've said implies um, that there aren't more conditions that might have arisen. I mean, I'm implicitly saying that's true, but it's, it doesn't, it's not obvious that, that it's enough. But, but it's clear that, as you said, that invertibility follows. So that. Yeah, that was my question, whether or not the notion of a modular category includes someone No. Um, okay, so, well, so that's kind of now, that's sort of going from the geometry to the algebra. And so just to state the, um, the other direction, I really don't intend to say anything about it, about the proof today. Um, but the theorem just to connect with what Andre has built, is that if you take the category of tilting modules of um, this category U res at um, where Q to the 2L is 1, and then you mod out by the negligible morphisms, as Andre described this morning, so that that whole category, which he showed as ribbon, the claim is that that is actually modular when certain conditions are satisfied. 
Um, actually, Andre already mentioned them. The first one is that big D divides L. So just remind you, D is this number that's in 1, 2 is either 1, 2, or 3, depending on whether it's uh, the Dinkin diagram is simply laced or whether it's G2 or if it's anything else, then it's 2. Um, what? Uh, OK. Um, well, so if in the Dinkin diagrams that Andre drew, if there aren't any double or triple arrows, then big D is 1. If there are double arrows, then double lines, then it's 2. And if there's a triple line, then this constant is 3. Um, and then the other condition is that this root of unity, that the, the order of Q is big enough in a certain sense. So in, well, in the following specific sense, L over D needs to be at least the inner product of alpha, the highest root, and rho plus 1. So Andre already drew some pictures of this value this morning. Basically, this just says that, um, well, I already said it, that the order of Q is sufficiently large. If the order is, is much is smaller than that, then this whole category ends up being trivial. There, um, it uh, you know this quotient operation just crushes everything, so there's nothing left. Um, so those are trivial cases, and provided that this condition is satisfied, then the category is non-trivial and is modular. Um, well, and. So then putting that together with the other story, the corollary is that associated to some G and an L as over there, um, then we have that was over there then we have an associated TFT with whose value on the circle is this category, whatever, let me call it curly T. Does that look like a curly T? OK. Um, so that's the general statement. but. What I'd like to do is kind of look in a little more detail at this modularity condition for SL2 in particular. Which already gives a pretty good idea of what's going on. So we want to, um, yeah. Uh, no, so the claim is just that um, that this gadget is a modular tensor category. So, so the the kind of big picture logic is that you start with. G and L, and then you build the quantum group, and then you um, do all of the gymnastics that Andre discussed, and then you build this category and its quotient, and then finally you have modular tensor category. And then you kind of um, go over here, and using that modular tensor structure, you write down the values of all of the different generators of the Bordism category, and that constructs for you a TFT. Yeah.
category is modular. I mean, I know that there's that condition, but, but just by having a modular tensor category, you will not get your condition that is uh, the condition of S with a C inverse with the identity G1. But I thought to construct a PFT, you really wanted a condition on S for that. Because it holds on the board of the graph. Um. <clears throat> Well, but the, um, okay, uh, I'm not sure whether or not this even begins to address your question, but um, suppose that we've, pro suppose we've demanded that this be invertible. So the, the claim, the implicit claim, which I didn't say explicitly, is that provided this is invertible, then the court, so I didn't write down what so then the claim is that the equation is actually satisfied. Yeah, you have a, yep. Sorry. Sorry, yes, thank you, Andre. So that's very clarifying. Um, exactly, so I didn't say anything about what S inverse would need to be. And, uh, okay, SL2. So what do we wanna do? Um, well, really what I am plan to do is just literally to compute the S matrix for SL2 and I'm going to leave you to think about why it might be invertible. So, so we want to compute these constants. Um, so now the, um, the representations are just labeled by the highest weight. So I'm going to just call them N and M now. And you'll also forgive me, I was, was vaguely being careful to always write I and J on the left-hand side so that I star and J star would be on the right-hand side. I'm going to cease being careful and just write N and M in the places that are easier to write them. Um, so where do N and M live? These are both in zero up to L minus two as Andre said this morning. So those are the simple objects for quantum SL2 at the um, root of unity such that Q to the 2L is one. So the idea for computing this is the following. So we're going to write this as the trace of this same operator we sort of saw before, <clears throat> and M. So obviously if we just trace that operator, it's by definition that thing. And this is a simple object N so that this, whatever is inside here is just some scalar. Um, and so, so if we could compute this operator, then we could certainly compute its trace, and that operator is just a scalar. And so um, how can we compute that scalar? Well, it's, so that implies that it's sufficient to, 
to compute this operator here on a highest weight vector. of the representation, um, the n-dimensional representation, I'll call it W sub n. Let me call the highest weight vector little w sub n. So that it's going to go to some multiple of itself, and that's the scalar we care about. Um, so now we need to, well, this this operator involves the braiding, so we're going to need to actually use the R matrix that Andre constructed. So we need to recall what the R matrix was. So one of the formulas he wrote down for the SL2 R matrix was Q to the 1 half H tensor H times the sum of I bigger than 0, Q to the I choose 2. Um, 1 over I quantum I factorial EM tensor FM. Okay, I think we no longer need well, no, I might want to return to those computations. So I'm going to continue just using these boards over here. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Yeah, somehow I was the name of a generic simple object in an abstract category in my mind, so I wanted to indicate that these were actually natural numbers. Um, okay, so, and just for convenience, let me define R naught to just be the I equals zero term of this. So when I equals zero, these two constant factors don't contribute and those are both the identities, so I just see Q to the one-half H tensor H as the first term in that sum. Oh, and it's actually kind of important now for what I'm about to do that I've now switched, well, because I'm using the formula Andre wrote down, I've now switched to Andre's convention about R, not the one I used in my lectures, which means that this R matrix acts on a braiding by first acting on the elements and then doing the switch operation. Um, okay, so now let's compute with that. So we're interested in this operator where I'm going to feed in the highest weight vector W sub n and I'm going to read out the multiple of W sub n that I got at the end. Um, and this thing was labeled M. So let's write that down explicitly. So I start, I feed in the vector W sub n, and then, well, the first thing I do is I have, well, okay, I guess the very first thing I do is I have that evaluation, uh, that co-evaluation map over there. And the next thing I do is I have an R matrix acting on these two factors, which I then switch. And then I have another R matrix for the second braiding acting on those two factors, which I then switch back. And then I evaluate, except that this was you know, what really happened here was that um, <clears throat> I was taking the quantum trace, so I had to multiply by the charmed element here. Okay. 
Um, so now we can just pull these two strands apart to simplify this expression. So we're still feeding in Wn, and we're still multiplying by the charmed element there, and still acting by R there, but now this second factor of R, the two legs got switched, so we get a copy of R bar acting there. And now um, let's write this back in formulas now that we've untangled things a little bit. So I can think about this as the following. I can think about having taken R times R bar in that order. That was some operator on this tensor of two, this tensor of these two simple modules. And then I'm taking the quantum trace of the second, I'm taking the quantum trace just in the second factor. And then I'm evaluating that whole thing on the highest weight vector, w little sub n. Um, OK, so now is the first moment when we really need the formulas. So we're going to be, if we wrote out this, um, this whole expression using all of the evaluation and co-evaluation maps, after we'd done that, then the next thing we would do is we would feed in W sub n tensor some sum over the weights of this other representation and the dual weights. And then we would feed it into this formula for, for R. And the, the W sub n, the first thing that hits it is E sub i, which is some raising operator, which kills W sub n. So if i is positive, then that immediately dies, which means all the terms in the summation other than r is 0 are immediately killed. And so that is just the same as tracing the second factor of r bar r naught, and again evaluating on w sub n. Um, <clears throat> and Um, OK, but then, um, then we can keep going and look at what's happening for this R bar. So what is R bar? Well, R bar, the only thing that happens that's interesting is that these two factors get switched. So we now have Fi in the first factor and Ei in the second factor. And now we're going to be tracing over the second factor. Well, but those operators, which are now the um, EIs, those operators are all nilpotent. And so their traces are all 0. Again, unless um, we're talking about the very first term, r bar is 0. So that now is the trace of r bar is 0 r is 0 on Wn. But the 0 piece is in R is symmetric, so I can just delete this bar. I just have R0 squared. And now I can write out what that is. Uh, do I have space? Yeah, maybe. So what is that? Well, so let's write that explicitly. What is this operator? So this is trace of W maps to Q to the, OK, so now what was R0 squared? Well, R0 squared is just Q to the H tensor H. And so I evaluate um, in the first factor on W to the N, my highest weight. So I get H of WN. And then in the second factor, I get H of whatever vector W, which was living in the second representation W sub M. Gave. So um, again, everywhere I wrote trace, I really meant this quantum trace that Andre described. Yeah, exactly. So 
So let me continue that over here. So what is that? Well, um, <clears throat> well, it's just the sum. So I'm taking. So first of all, I'm taking the quantum trace. So I need to multiply by this charmed element. So this is the sum over the weights of Wm. So this is going to be a sum from. Let me write it like this: i equals minus m up to. M, but I'm going to step by twos. So I go minus M, minus M plus two, and so on, because those are how the characters of SL2 modules um, appear. And then what do I see? Well, I see Q to the H of WN times H of W sub i, this weight here. Maybe I should have used different letters for the two different representations, but hopefully um, it's clear. Well, maybe I will. So let me call these V sub i. So V sub i now are these weights in W sub m. And then I multiply the whole thing by the charmed element, which, as Andre told us, was two row evaluated on V sub i. But in the SL2 case, two row just is H. And so we're just getting one more copy of Q to the H of VI. So we can just, um, well, I won't write it out. That's just what it is. Um, and of course, what is H of VI, well, it's just I. So now we can write down this whole expression. Um, or maybe, oh, sure, yes, thank you. Um, But now where this whole thing was just to compute the operator on this vector here, and so we still need to trace off on the other side in order to um, get the full S matrix, and maybe it's still on the board. Um, nope, not still on the board. Where we computed that, um, where we computed that this operator was just the, um, the quantum dimension of, <clears throat> um, of n times the scalar that we got. So we did that calculation a minute ago. That was this little lemma that was right there. And so that the dilemma applied to this situation, taking the trace of this other piece tells us immediately that SNM is equal to the quantum dimension of N, which is quantum N plus 1 times sum I equals minus M to M by 2's of Q to the n plus 1. So this gave us n, and then we had one more copy. Um, so this is times i. And so the n i came from this factor, and then the 1 times i came from the charmed element. And so now let's look at this whole expression. Well, let's draw a picture of it. So suppose for simplicity that the, that the dimension of that the, suppose M is even um, so that I can center my picture around zero, but the same argument works if N is odd. So then what do I see here? Well, I see it looks like the quantum dimension of 
th this representation m, except that it's scaled up by this factor of n plus one. So the very first, the next step that's occurring is at spot 2n plus 2, and then 4n plus 4, and so on. So that might be a picture of this sum here. Ah. Yes, I understand. I'm getting to that. Is that closer? OK, so this whole thing might be a picture of this sum here. Um, and then we're going to multiply by this quantum dimension. Well, this thing goes from um, <clears throat> Well, again, it depends on the, the parity, but um, we put a copy of quantum n plus 1 shifted, centered at each of these spots. And because that's exactly half of this distance, you can check they exactly fill up this whole thing, except they're gaps of 2 in between, which is exactly what we wanted. And then this whole sum ends up being quantum n plus 1 times m plus 1. And so the claim is that that is the SL2 S matrix. OK. Um, hmm. So now, uh, assuming one went and checked that that, and this is now actually, so you know, for a given root of unity, this is some explicit matrix of complex numbers. Um, and so assuming one checks that that is, in fact, invertible, then that um, shows the modularity condition which means that we could justify ourselves in actually computing some invariance in the SL2 case. And so maybe I'll spend just the last couple of minutes looking at some painfully concrete examples. Um, so, OK, what do we need to know? Uh, what did I get to? So we need to know these dimensions dj and somewhere, um, well, we need to know these operators theta um, because they're going to come into the picture as well. And so for SL2, well, we've already used repeatedly that the um, quantum dimension of the ith representation is quantum i plus 1. And then this morning, Andre told us that theta i was the operator q to the 1 half i squared plus i. i is the highest weight here. And so I think I'll do just one explicit example. So this is going to take L to be 4. So Q is some eighth root of unity. Um, so then what is this? What are, so then what are the representations that I have? So the irreducible representations, the ones with highest weight, 0, 1, and 2. And what are their quantum dimensions? Well. It's 1 square root of 2 and 1. That's just what you get if you evaluate the quantum numbers. For instance, this is Q inverse, you know, quantum, um, 
quantum two is Q inverse plus Q, and you evaluate that at an eighth root of unity, and you get square root two. And then what are the theta i's? Well, you can just explicitly um, compute the formula from what Andre told us this morning, and what you get is one, and then you get e to the two pi i three over 16, and minus one. So this is kind of our table of basic data for SL2 at an eighth root of unity. Maybe I should really call it a fourth root of unity since people are usually in these matters refer to the, they say root of unity when they mean the order of um, Q squared rather than Q. Okay, so let's go about trying to compute the um, invariant of the field theory invariant of RP3 in a particular presentation. So um, I'm just going to put a little star here to remind you that it's going to depend on the bounding four manifold and we could then remove that dependence later if we felt like it. And maybe I'll do that too. Um, okay, so first of all, we need a presentation of RP3. So let's do that. So we can start with the empty manifold and then create a sphere and then punch a hole in the sphere and then do a double Dane twist on this central leg and then reverse the process. Um, <clears throat> where was that? Oh. Okay, so let's actually compute this on string diagrams. So we start here with nothing, nothing here, and then this, um, this place where you punch a hole is the first place where something interesting happens. We introduce a bunch of strings labeled by i and a sum of di over p. That's what epsilon op told us to do. And then we do theta squared, and so that multiplies this element, each element i by theta i, so this now gives us sum of di times theta i squared over p. Sorry, I'm writing the summation below, but I'm really summing over these constants times the picture above. And then I do epsilon. Epsilon was one of the things that didn't do anything, so I'm left with just this i loop sitting in here and the same sum di theta i squared over p. And then I kill it. Um, what did killing do? One over p. So then finally at the last stage I have, oh, and this loop now contributes another quantum dimension. So I have sum di squared theta i squared over p squared. So that's actually, well, I just, so that's now the sort of general formula. And now we can think about what it actually gives in the case of SL2. Um, and I guess well, I still have it on the board, what P is in terms of the sum. So the, the global dimension here, so we have one plus the square of this, two, four. So P is two in uh, this particular level for SL2. And so what do we get? So this now, let's just write it out. So we have di squared times theta i squared. So the first term is just one. Oh, well, we have one over four out front. And then we have one plus two times the square of that. So two e to the two pi i three over eight. And then there's another factor of one from the last part, this one and that one become a two. And then these twos 
cancel that too, so there you go. Some actual complex number associated to a three manifold. And if we wanted to, um, we could instead correct by dividing out by this factor determined by the signature of the bounding four manifold produced by this procedure. And I won't write down the computation. It's sort of just a similar um, moving around these di's and theta i's and p's. And well, you end up, well, if I did it correctly at 3 a.m. last night, you end up getting cosine of 3 pi over 8, which is now the actual resch and triave invariant of that three manifold full stop. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you all very much.